here. Um, as you may have seen, I have the full hour to myself. So it's either going to be a lot of questions or we get a head start to whichever you prefer. Um, so my name is Jorge Arias. I am a transportation engineering consultant with Kittleson Associates. Uh, for those that don't know, it's a consulting company based out of Portland, but my home office is in Oakland here in California. Uh, however, the, the work that I'm presenting here, which is on, on flexible car sharing, is based on work that I did as part of my master's thesis at UC Berkeley. So um, after I graduated and I started working, I kept doing, kept doing this on, on the side. I, I recruited a, a fellow transportation enthusiast. His name is John Doig, he's over there. He is a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley at the, the transportation engineering department. Uh, unfortunately, uh, John couldn't be here today, so as it goes, if anything goes wrong with the presentation, I'm blaming it on him. Um, but yeah, uh, moving on, um, what I'm going to talk today is uh, flexible car sharing, which you may have heard by another name, uh, one-way car sharing. It's a, it's a recent trend in, in, uh, in the car sharing industry. So before, before I go into the details of, of, uh, of my thesis work, or the, or the visualization aspects, I want to give you guys some perspective on the things that drove me to study this subject in the first place. Um, I don't want this talk to end with equations or data, but rather with an idea, which I think is an idea that's important to, to the sustainable, walkable communities that we all, uh, we all like to talk about. So that's uh, um, a lot of places in the US look like this. It's, uh, type of cookie cutter development you, you see in uh, SARS excerpts all around our metropolitan areas. So one thing that this fosters is car dependency, because if you live in one of these, you really don't have much choice other than to own and, and drive a car every day. The reasons behind why this is so popular definitely go beyond the scope of my presentation here today, but it's something I'm always uh, willing to talk about and uh, I'd like to learn about, so if you want to talk to me about this, I'll be, I'll be free afterwards. Um, so yeah, instead of this, I'd rather see mixed-use communities that promote multimodal transportation. Uh, Berkeley, California is a great example. Um, this, this area is south side Berkeley, it's near campus, but you see a lot of, of mixed-use. You got uh, retail on the bottom, housing on the top, you got so many restaurants, uh, people on bikes, a lot of people walking. So, uh, Mainly through my personal experience in Berkeley, I realized that multimodalism goes beyond transportation and actually touches up on quality of life. I feel that if you have more transportation choices, um, you probably have more disposable income because you don't have to spend as much money getting from A to B. Uh, you're likely to have more social interaction when you meet people on buses or meet people in the street riding bikes. Finally, I think it gives you a lot of opportunities to exercise um, it, it, it improves public health by getting people uh, out of their cars and onto a bike or, or, uh, or, or as a pedestrian. So, but, but one thing when you look at this picture, you just don't have people walking or, or, or riding bikes, you have cars, cars are front and center. So with all, with all that Berkeley has to offer in other similar cities, you still see a lot of cars and you question why. And I'll, say, I'll let Simcar say the best, they say sometimes you just need a car. If you're going to a work meeting, you have uh, all your plans rolled up, you got boxes of, uh, of files, you're not going to take them on a bike. If you go shopping, you don't want to be lugging boxes or bags around with you. It's nicer if you have a car to do it. This one's my favorite. You get dumped, you'd rather have a car to take your stuff, uh, not go all the way to the bus stop. So, um, does that mean that we should all go ahead and just buy a car? And I, I, I don't think so. Um, this one, I mean, this one goes a little bit too far, but you, you get the point. So, um, this was uh, World War II propaganda, as you can see, and it was, um, it was really not talking about the car sharing as we see it today, but it was called uh, car sharing as they see it in England. It's more of carpooling, so when you, you gather and you share rights. So, um, but in, in essence, you get a lot of the same benefits. So what happens with uh, car sharing is that you take the fixed cost of owning a car, and you're splitting it among the uh, members to vehicle ratio, which could be as high as 50 in some of the systems that are out there today. Uh, so that, that, makes, that makes car sharing, if you don't drive a lot, it makes car sharing uh, much more economical than 
owning and operating a car. Now, I'm not going to say that it, it's more convenient because car sharing does have some drawbacks. So, particularly with Zipcar and systems like Zipcar, you have a lot of uh, you have a lack of flexibility, really. Where before you make your trip, you have to reserve the car in advance. Tell them, I'm going to start my trip at this time. I'm going to end it at this other time. And you have to uh, return the car to the same place you picked it up. That can result in uh, what I like to call time anxiety. So if you, for some reason, traffic is bad, you had to run an extra air and something didn't go according to plan, uh, it's, it gives you time anxiety because you have to return the car at the time you reserved it. If not, you, you can face uh, penalties that go like $50 or so, uh, even for five minutes late. So, it, it, it's got some drawbacks for sure. Now, in the last uh, five years, uh, three years in the US, there's been a shift to what I've been calling flexible car sharing. So what flexible car sharing does is it reduces these, uh, these drawbacks by letting people uh, get into a car without a reservation, pay by the minute without any time commitment. So um, you get in the car, you, you can, Pick it up from one spot, you can return it to a different spot, it can take you one hour, it can take you two hours, you're paying by the minute up to, a, up to an hourly cap. But it gives you that flexibility that you don't have when you use SIP card. So, um, if, if that isn't clear, I'm going to let uh, this video from car to go explain it. Um, this was from 2010 when they were first going into Austin, they put together this video showing how the system worked. Uh, it looks a little bit like an infomercial at this point. Uh, and I assure you, I am not getting sales commission for car to go they're just sharing data with me. Uh, but you see people are unhappy with, with, with owning a car. And uh, I guess that's an insurance bill. After seeing this, you're probably wondering why, why a civil engineer uh, or a transportation engineer is looking into this subject, right? Um, but so, just to give you a little bit of background, 
uh, my thesis was focused on uh, fleet sizing you such a system. Registration events or just register so, online. Whereas you when you're when your SIM card, I guess or, I can stop that. Right? If you want, reserve in advance by phone or on the car to go website. Uh, whereas SIP card, they know where their cars are, at least when they're available, and at what times they're going to be available. A company like car to go can know that because uh, they're free float, they're free floating. People can return to a different place, and they can rent them for uh, basically an unlimited period of time. They don't need to tell car to go uh, how long they'll be using the car. So, so fleet sizing for for a one-way car sharing company becomes a, a big issue, and it's. It's definitely an engineering issue, and that's why I looked at it. So, um, I did dimensional analysis, and I figured out that uh, the fleet size of a system will depend on, on three factors. The first one would be uh, the ratio of walking distance to city size. So, you got a big city, and you got uh, how, how far would, uh, people are willing to walk. That's one factor. Second factor is the number of cars expected to be in use simultaneously. And this, again, this brings in other variables. I mean, we can idealize it as bringing in other variables like city size, the speed of travel, and the demand. So that goes into the second factor. Uh, finally, um, a, a very important one is the availability target that you set. So do you want the system to be 95% available so that when you walk out the door, there's a 95% chance that you're going to find a car uh, within walking distance, or do you want it to be 80%, 60%? So, these three factors um, are expected to give you a good sense of, of, um, of what the fleet size should be. My thesis looked at the impact of, of that availability target, that third factor, and um, the idea was to, to look at the available cars at any given moment and see how much of, of, of the operating area was within, within coverage of the cars. So uh, I I got data from car to go and what they were giving me is, uh, so this is Portland, and uh, most of the presentation will be based in Austin, will be with Austin data, but for an example, I threw up there Portland, so this is what I'm getting from car to go They give me the locations at any given time, the locations of the available cars. So my idea was, okay, so I, um, I have my analytical framework, I did a simulation uh, for my thesis, how can I compare it to what's really happening out there? So uh, I started from this, then I took it more in this direction. So I got the simulation on the left. Um, the, gray, the gray squares, they represent areas where an available car is not within walking distance, not within a third of a mile. Uh, the darker green areas are um, patches or locations where you have a lot of cars nearby. So uh, on the right side, I have what real life looks like. So this is Austin. And the operating area is shaded in, in a blue uh, with a gray boundary. Then you have the cars, they're black dots, and I drew uh, third mile buffers around these cars that represent the walking distance. Then the idea was to compute the area of the union of the buffers and then uh, divide that by the operating area. That, sh that should give me uh, what I've been calling an availability. So, um, this was our, our first track at it. Um, it, was, it was very manual. It was done in, in GIS. We had the uh, XY data. Then we uh, just drew the buffers uh, through that buffer tool and uh, computed the area. So this was something that we were doing uh, one by one. So uh, these frames are they're one by one. We computed them separately and we just put them in GIS together. So uh, not really a lot of, uh, a lot of innovation there. Uh, but what, what, what it showed was that uh, my simulation, uh, which, which are the gray bars here, was uh, sort of close to, to the actual availability that I was seeing day to day in Austin. And uh, I mean, they're not exactly the same. I, I did a lot of uh, simplifications to my simulation, a lot of these parameters, their daily, their averages, but it got me to something I felt comfortable with. So I was, uh, I was happy to see that. This was basically the ending point of my thesis. I, I mean, I had data, I did a comparison to my simulation, I followed it the day. Then after I graduated, I kept, uh, we, we kept pushing. We, we wanted to, to turn this, we wanted to do it on, on a more real time, maybe real time is not the right word, but uh, automated fashion that we could uh, have the positions of the cars at, say, 30 second intervals and calculate the area 
automatically 30 second intervals. So um, we took it a step further. And let me see. This video is not going to come to the screen. It's not gonna... Give me a second. Now. All right, there you see. Cool. So um, basically, it's a lot like the graphic I showed you guys earlier, but now it's automated. It's it's light, not light, but it, it moves. Uh, what we what we were looking at was availability again, drawing those cars, drawing those third mile buffers, and overlaying them with each other, and seeing how what patterns we can we can take from this visualization. And um, uh, one of the great ideas John had was to put this bar on the bottom, showing the time and the number of cars available uh, as the animation goes on. So we can see um, we we color coded this so. You got uh, blue for, for night hours, yellow for day hours. But you can see it gets a lot of usage during the day. Then a lot of cars become available at night. And uh, one of the interesting things was that you see that it's the day starting, they start to travel around downtown, which I don't know how you are familiar with Austin, but you, you can see all the cars bunching up right there. As the PMP car goes, travelers take those very same cars they took in in the morning, they take them back out. So, at midnight, it's actually pretty balanced. Um, so when you look at it daily, the system keeps itself balanced, um, which was a, a surprise to me. I thought it was going to be, um, I didn't think it was going to be steady state. I thought it was going to be something that would uh, deteriorate over time. But on a daily basis, it, it, it goes back to equilibrium. So of course, Saturday night, so let's see. Saturday night, they start bunching up. And they don't, bunch, they don't go back out. They stay in downtown uh, till very early on Sunday morning. So <laughs> it is Austin, so you can draw you can draw your own conclusions. Um, but so we, we kept thinking about the, the ways we can do that again. All right, so um, we wanted to do it a little bit different, and this is a heat map of the very same thing. So we got available cars. Now, instead of showing the buffers and seeing them bunched up against each other, we have a, a big red blob. So um, you can see in downtown, again, uh, bunching up during the day, then they start scattering. And in midnight, um, this midnight on a, on a Tuesday morning, it's, it's pretty uniform, uniformly distributed across the city. Again, uh, morning rush comes in, downtown gets full. Um, so I mean, it's, it's, these are things that are nice to look at, but the key is that they enable us to make observations of how the system is performing in Austin. And if I'm car to go, I want to know exactly where I should be placing vehicles so that uh, so that I can serve my uh, my customers better. So uh, yeah, the heat map. Um, the heat map is basically just the representation with uh, color coding for for the available vehicles, and um, so. To this point, I've been always talking about available vehicles, vehicles that are not in use, vehicles that are just standing around, because that's the data I have. But then I thought the real interesting part is once people get in these cars, where do they go? What do they do? How are their trip patterns? So of course, I'm not getting that data uh, from car to go I don't even think they have it. It's, I mean, it's sensitive, definitely privacy sensitive. So I mean, that didn't stop us. We took our best guess. and. Um, we did some data crunching, and I'll walk you through it now, but um, the, the, it, it, it gives us an estimate of how vehicles are moving through Austin, uh, given, given the availability of the data that we have. So this is how we did it. Uh, as I mentioned, I got this uh, source data. It's from uh, Cartigo. I did a lot of the data crunching in Java and S3 uh, ArcGIS. Uh, Java was mainly to determine um, 
when trips occur. So uh, I can, I mean, I can. It, it's a little bit more detail than I wanted to get, but uh, we can talk about it if you're interested. So just an estimate of when the trip happened. Uh, our GIS gave us uh, routing information. So if we have a set of trips, we can estimate based on least least distance or least time, we can estimate what's the likely route that that trip took. Finally, uh, to make this all nice and pretty, we put it on D3 JavaScript on uh, Google Maps API. <coughs> and I will, um, I will show you two or three slides down. So again, what we, what we started with, same picture, we just have vehicle locations. I took a snapshot of this every 30 seconds. Every 30 seconds I was storing uh, vehicle locations. It, it grows very quickly, by the way. It's, we ate gigabytes and gigabytes of data that we needed to sort through. So, of course, we can do that manually. So, we use Java to tell us um, where a car, where a trip started, where a trip ended. That's all we knew. We have, um, we have the uh, latitude and longitude for each trip start and trip end. Now, um, we fired up our GIS and we gave it these coordinates. And um, and the network, so it needs it needs to know the roadway network, and it gave us uh, routes. So for each trip that we had, and we had a lot of trips, we had a route. So once you have these two things, you can come on and do something like this. So uh, in this in this drawing, you got the white dots. You really can't see them too well, but the white dots are vehicles that are available. They are not moving, and we have black dots that are trips and their likely route. So it's not that we know these people took the highway. It's that we estimated based on their starting and ending locations that the highway was the likely route. So um, as you can see, I mean, a lot of the things we were seeing in the availability diagrams we see here in the flow, in the flow visualizations. And it's just, I mean, downtown gets crowded uh, Saturday, what is it? Well, we're in Sunday now. So, uh, as with any car sharing um, system, we see a lot of activity on weekends. So, uh, people who use car sharing, they are not using it, or at least not every day for commute purposes. They use it uh, for occasional trips, and they they have transit, or, or they bike, or they walk to get to and from their uh, just you know nine to five jobs. Um, so that's why uh, the number of vehicles available is really it's it's lower in weekends <coughs> than it is in, in during the weekday. And this is something that's different from from traditional uh, transportation engineering. A uh, question on that? Yes, many of the white dots don't appear to have moved the entire time the animation's been running. Are, I mean, yeah. are those vehicles that they should be repositioning someplace else, or people that you know have them for the weekend, so it's not moving because they haven't checked out? Right. Uh, uh, actually, in fact, if they haven't checked out, they would be black and they would be moving very slow. If they have, if they haven't checked out for an entire, because I only know start location, end location, start time, end time. So I, I guess a speed based on that <coughs> and on the route. Uh, but yeah, I mean, white dots that are not moving, yeah, cars that are available, nobody's picking them up. So it, I mean, it tells us that there is a lot of availability here in uh, here in Austin, so but there, it's concentrated in downtown mostly. Cardigo will let cars sit, for, I believe it's for up to 72 hours. And so you're looking at a week's length of time there. So if a car just sits for a day or two days without moving, for Cardigo, for most part, that's fine. After about 72 hours, they'll send somebody out to move that car back to a higher Demand usage area. area. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. That's correct. Yeah, I heard similar from Cardigo. A uh, question there? Yeah, do you get the stops during the trip uh, by stats? Someone stops at the grocery store? No, no. They yeah. will not de disable the car, they will keep it. Well, th there is an option, I, I believe, uh, that they, I think they were piloting this in Germany where you can check out of the car but keep it so that only you can take it and they charge you a lower rate for that. I think it's like a parking, parking mm -hmm. rate versus a usage rate. So uh, since it didn't become available, I wouldn't see it in that in that uh, KML that they that they gave me. No. So if it doesn't become available, I won't see it here. If I don't see it here, I can't uh, I can't end the trip. So 
uh, yeah, that, that is a limitation. The, the, uh, this is, uh, it, it takes a lot of assumptions. Uh, fortunately, I'm not, I didn't do my thesis on this. This just was something that was cool to look at and it makes for a nice presentation. <laughs> it's just, everybody loves see, uh, seeing cars move, so. If, if you want to, maybe in Montreal, we have the data from Communauto. It's a big car sharing company. Yeah. And actually, they give, out, they, they give us the entire GPS traces. So wow. it would be great to see the, the real pattern during yeah. the trip and the stops on the way. So wow, that is something that's not going to happen in the US. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah. It's, a, it's a partnership. We cannot use it for yeah. anything. I'm sure it's but anonymized and all that. Yeah. But yeah. But no, that would be great. I'll definitely talk to you about that. And car to go is coming to Montreal. They are starting like November. Wow. So yeah. we will have a comparison between coming to because mm -hmm. they started uh, uh, using cars the same way uh, car to go mm -hmm. does. But they also have the the, the zip car uh, the two way the with two -way. preservation. So we we'll yeah. compare this. So it's really interesting. Yeah. So at first, now that you mentioned at first. Um, and if you look at that, if you remember that Austin video from car to go it seems that they were putting a lot of effort into promoting the car itself rather than the system. So at the beginning, I thought, I thought it was more of a marketing ploy for car to go to get people into smart cars and hopefully buy them later. But uh, as you say, and they, they've expanded very rapidly, I think they've been, uh, they've been thinking more about it and they can see that the future lies in, in selling access to cars rather than selling mm. uh, cars themselves. So, um, so that, that gives me a good segue into the timeline. So uh, this is just a brief, uh, my view of car sharing. Car sharing has been around for longer than this. But uh, the way I see um, one-way car sharing, it really really started in 2008 in Ulm, Germany, with a pilot study by car 2 uh, 2009, we had some people in, in MIT, uh, the media lab. They were, they were working on a city car. That you've probably seen some news, they, it folds up. So the idea for that car was to uh, to operate it in a one-way car sharing fashion. So, uh, car to go came to the United States in Austin, 2010. Uh, got some competition from Drive Now, uh, which is uh, by BMW. Uh, They're in Berlin, Munich, in 2011. Uh, car to go kept expanding, and right now, when you look at 2013, you got car to go in 25 U.S. and European cities. You got Drive Now. Uh, by, DM, by BMW in San Francisco, Berlin, Munich, and I think I'm missing a German city. Uh, you have Auto Lead in Paris, and uh, now, now coming Auto, that also does a one way. Uh, they are expecting 100 cities in the US and Europe uh, by 2015. So what is keeping uh, this, this industry alive? I mean, look at some opportunities, uh, the demographics. So a lot of the, the millennials, the younger people, they feel a survey by car, by Zipcar found that more people rather have a phone than rather have a car. So but this is by Zipcar, so it may be biased, but a lot of us millennials depend on our smartphones more than our cars. And we use our smartphones to order taxi rides, to check the bus schedule. Uh, sometimes it, uh, it substitutes for some interaction and some errands we would have to run with if we didn't have the, the smartphone. So uh, changing demographics is definitely an opportunity for car sharing. Um, a move toward complete streets, and this is a term you've been hearing a lot of times as transportation professionals. Uh, almost always that I've seen these complete streets projects, they, they include a car sharing element. Uh, not, not big, but maybe they'll, they'll say, okay, add, add a few zip car spots here and there. But so this is also an opportunity for, for companies like car to go drive now um, to go in and say, we can, we can make the street more walkable by taking cars off the road if people, instead of owning one, they just, uh, they just buy, buy into one, buy access into one. Uh, finally, and uh, this is a graph you've probably already seen before, uh, rural versus urban population in the world, we crossed that threshold already. And Car sharing is something that would only work in urban environments because you depend on having people in close proximity to each car. If you have people scattered around, they have to walk 
one mile to get to a car that they're not going to use. They're going to own their own car and they're going to forget about car sharing. So, so demographics, the, the drive to complete streets, more transit use, and, uh, and a shift in, um, in, in the location or the preference of people's uh, location. Um, it, these are opportunities for, for car sharing to grow. Um, one of the objectives, uh, I'll bring up the challenges that we have. Parking is definitely the biggest challenge to one-way car sharing. It, it is hard for Zipcar, but, um, but the, the, the problem is minuscule when you compare it to one-way car sharing. So Zipcar typically goes in, uh, they talk to a private garage or they talk to a city, and they buy two, three spots to park their cars. People know where the Zipcars are, they go there. But for a system like park to goes to work, they need to have a contract with the city that allows them to park the cars at meter spot, at any, any legal on-street spot, not pay the meter, and not worry about uh, time, time constraints or, or similar. So um, this is a huge contentious issue. And in some cities, like San Francisco, it parking is such a nightmare that they haven't been able to, to make a deal with, with car to go and with similar one-way car sharing companies. Um, so it, it's definitely a challenge that needs to be worked on, and people hopefully they can do a better, um, better job of reaching people and saying, okay, this is good. Even though we're taking over, you know, we're putting 300 cars more in the city, in essence, each car sharing car can take seven or eight cars out of circulation from people who either sell them, um, and then if you add the people who forego purchasing a car, it's more around 13. Good. Yeah. So the parking lot, have you looked at the way those deals are are structured? I mean, I know in our city in San Diego, you know, car goes are still relatively new. They were able to broker a deal individually with the city, but there's more competition for these services that come online. The legal framework at the municipal level isn't going to allow for one firm to yeah. broker a deal. So mm -hmm. have you looked at how the competition amongst these firms? Or I mean, I've work? touched up on it. I, my focus has been on the engineering aspects. Uh, but obviously, this is something I'm interested in. I've read uh, a few things about it. And for example, in San Francisco, they have a big no-no about uh, making one, benefiting one private company over others. So even though Car2Go has approached them, they don't want to put Car2Go in this position and then zip car further down or uh, city car share, which is a nonprofit, further down. Um, just for, for you guys, for your knowledge, the way that it works is the company Car2Go reimburses the cities for their usage of the parking spots. And I believe the car to go is responsible for the accuracy of the information, right? And they'll just send a check. Um, but yeah, definitely a contentious issue and uh, something that needs to be worked on. But it, it, I think it's part, if you, if you put the benefits out there, say you're actually making the, the parking situation better by giving people a choice to not own a car, I think it can be, you can turn this challenge into an opportunity. Finally, um, not, not very profitable. So this is uh, car to go at did the losses up to quarter four 2011. And they were, they were in the hole. I think uh, they turned around right after this. They started making some profit and then they got sold to, to Avis, rent the car for I think 500 million or something like that. So it, hasn't, it wasn't profitable for Sitka for a long time. While car to go is not gonna share this information with anybody, I don't think they're making money. It's, they do have some cost savings in that they they own, I mean the company that owns car to go Daniel Chrysler produces the smart cars. And they also benefit a little bit from the marketing side. So in the end I think they're not making money, but when you look at it, transit usually doesn't make money. So um, the fact that this was close to break even already and that the private industry is putting money down tells me that it's got potential for um, I mean, if the federal government, if cities, if counties, Caltrans, they they feel the need to get involved. I think they can uh, they can do so without without paying a, a ton of money. So um, again, there's another challenge that needs to be worked, and hopefully, um, people from FHWA, uh, Caltrans, they'll 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 buy into it and they'll help, uh, turn this challenge into another opportunity. Uh, with that, I'm going to conclude. I'm going to take. Questions? We have we have a lot of time for questions. This was the only presentation. Um, so, uh, yes, this uh, this model sometimes is combined as well with uh, the use of electric cars. 
So I was wondering if, if you had study uh, what is the distribution of the duration of the trip from one point to the other, which would be a critical point in the case of electric car. So uh, can you repeat that? The distribution of the of the duration of, of, of the, the duration of the duration. Okay. I've looked at yeah, I've looked at the distribution of the durations, uh, but this is not something I plotted. But um, you mean in in terms of having people uh, giving giving them accurate range uh, for their trips? Yeah, definitely an issue. And San Diego's got an all electric fleet, so uh, I think it's also a matter of having the charging stations um, public, you know, freely available, so that when you when somebody returns the car, they can they can max it to one hundred right away. And this would this would help in that sense. Um, then another thing that uh, Jean, my my uh, coworker on this, was um, floating was you can you can look at out of the available cars, what are the chances people will pick one that's 50% charged versus one that's 80% charged? So it's a little bit of more choice you can throw in there, but I think it can help shed some light on on this range anxiety. So I mean, how how charged was the car? How long was that trip in distance? Um, so something like that. Good question. Yeah. Were you so when you're doing the 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 routing information? Um, were you just grabbing that from Cardigo's uh, public feed? Do you have to have a password? Right. Key, so or did they actually send an email you this? No. Uh, so I have API access okay. to uh, to Cardigo. And basically, this is all I get. This is all the developers. When if you're a developer and you want to put an app out there that shows where the car to go cars, this is what you get. It's a feed of the available cars. The routing, um, the routing came after some Java data crunching that gave me trip stars, trip ends, trip uh, times, and end times. Then we then we went onto uh, onto FGIS and with uh, OpenStreetMap data. We, we map uh, the likely routes. I mean, I'm not saying people put these routes that you see in the video. Just. Well, one of the things that sort of struck me with the map you had up with Austin, you know, as a user of Cardigo, you know, I abhor getting on the freeways with Cardigo. <laughs> it takes everything it's got to get up to 65. I uh, bet, so. but see that lady in the video, she said she can get on the freeway, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but but yeah, there was a lot of marketing yeah. for the car then. But Did I you look at that. that parity between though, between the, the trip in, so you know, whether or not a particular car ID was going back to the same place in a given evening. So yeah. you know, like I know like what I do is you know, I take it from work home and then mm -hmm. if it's still there in the morning I may take it back. If it's not, I'll take the bus. Did you look at that? Sort of parity distribution? No, no, I haven't looked at that, but that's a good point. I mean, I think a lot of people are using it that way, and uh, they, I mean, they check out, they make it available. If it's there, they'll take it. If not, they have alternate transportation modes. But again, that goes back to the point where this is not a silver bullet. Car sharing is not. Nothing is. It's just one more tool. If you have a good transit system, you can back it up with car sharing. You get a good biking network, you can back it up with car sharing for people who do grocery shopping and stuff like that. So actually, another question related to this: Have you uh, tried to, uh, to to look at the correlation between the location of the vehicles and the free transit stops? No, no, I haven't looked at that. Uh, I, the, the honest truth is that I I am very, I am not familiar with um, with Austin. A lot of our our initial work was was with Austin data because that was the only one available at the time. So I didn't really know a lot of what was going on in terms of interaction with campus or interaction with, with transit. I don't even know if Austin has a big transit system. Uh, but definitely, if they, if they ever make it into San Francisco, I'll, I'm sure I'll be looking into that. Do you know if uh, cars to go has access to the, the detailed um, travel data for the trips themselves? And they're looking at the travel behavior mm -hmm. of their users. Um, not releasing it, but internally yeah. to evaluate. I can only guess, but I'm, a I'm sure they have GPS system within the car. Right. And it's something that you, as a car sharing company, you naturally do uh, through the third theft and just track your vehicles. Um, I don't think, I, as long as they don't, that they don't ever release it to the public, I don't think there's anything wrong with them. Sure, not, not just if, they, if you would think they would be interested in the, the marketing side or evaluating their user base, I don't have any sense that they're doing that, but if I were them, I would probably do it. <laughs> in fact, we, we, communi we 
coming at all, we do this kind of thing. But they always uh, uh, remove the information about, about the member. So we know this is the, the car number that made this trip, but we cannot know who did that and why, so I think it's okay. So if you're, um, are you looking at things like um, the percentage of trips that go on shopping trips because people need a car for that kind of activity as opposed yeah, to a worker? It's difficult to know because you have to, to check where the, the, the car was parked. Right. And was it for for shopping? Or yeah, it's a, it can it's be done, but it's not perfect. But we we used it actually for uh, to evaluate congestion because to, to know the traffic, and we now are creating maps with uh, real travel time mm -hmm. for each segment of road in downtown Montreal to help uh, know the real travel time. And we, we want to weigh the, the Google uh, time with this data. And we got also taxi, uh, big taxi uh, GPS traces to do the same and compare the difference between taxi behavior and uh, car sharing behavior. So big data, but we are doing this right now. <laughs> And we believe that they're capturing information. I mean, we know that they have demographic information, so when you sign up, you have to put in your license information so they can confirm that you're a valid driver. But then when you get billed, you also get billed on the length of time you use the car, so you know, 12 minutes, 11 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever, at least as way as in San Diego. And then um, they also capture statistics on your driving behavior itself. So inside the car in San Diego, there's like a, how well are you driving? So it gives you scores on your acceleration, deceleration, and braking. Um, and you get to start getting warning messages if you do things that it doesn't like. Mm -hmm. And it'll actually revoke your membership if you drive too harshly. Um, so they capture that type of information. And then they're capturing you know, your start and end point. Well, they're, not, you're, they're capturing your route in progress. Mm -hmm. It's still not clear to us yet. The government, whether or not they're capturing that, we believe they probably are. One of the things we have found, though, is once the car becomes inactive, they stop tracking the location of the car. So if people park in an area where it's a tow away at a certain, like during rush hour, so it's a legal place to park during the middle of the day, but then it's a tow away for an extra travel lane, the cars just disappear from the system temporarily until somebody calls and says, I have attempted to get this car and it's no longer here. You know, it got towed. <laughs> car to go doesn't know it actually got towed until it can't find, until somebody can't find their reservation. So. Uh, then they'll retract it again, but they collect a lot of information. I suspect they did, yeah. Yeah, yeah but again, uh, the devil's in the details. They, it's not just making that deal to, to park your cars on streets. you got to be aware of the, all these little restrictions that vary block by block. Yeah. Well, they I pass mean, it on to the end user. So if you, car, if you leave a car where it gets towed, Mercedes isn't picking up that cost that gets then rebuilt back into your your usage statistics will charge you 100 bucks or 200 bucks to recover the car on your behalf. Yeah, I have a question. Um, yeah. Uh, when you talk about the uh, accessibility analysis to the car, so you use a, a, a buffer area, right? So you do for a three mile? Okay. Uh, third of a mile. Third of a mile. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah, this is a question <laughs> I had before, and hopefully I can get some input for you guys because I'm. I mean, I'm submitting this to theory. One of the questions I have: Why a third of a mile? And um, for for things like transit, like heavy heavy transit, uh, the assumption is half mile. Then you say buses, more like a quarter mile. I thought third mile was a good compromise, so I used that. But if you, has anybody here have any experience in terms of, of access to um, the transit walking distance? So uh, when, when we do the, you know, I'm from Toronto. Okay. Uh, so uh, when we do that, because right now we have a, we have a big uh, transit project for big move. So there's a 50 billion projects across uh, the future 10 years. So we, right now our office is actually uh, uh, responsible to, to do the proximity analysis around the uh, future transit uh, station. Yeah. So we actually use 500 meters. 500 meters, yeah. okay. Yeah, that's pretty close to a third. Yeah. Right. You might look at the, the the network is supposed to be clear. Right. Yes. Definitely, yeah. This is um, you're one side of the river, you may not be able to get there. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely a simplification <coughs> of this. 
uh, it was going to get too complicated to calculate that distance for each dot. Question on that? Um, yeah, this is, well, two questions. More on the, the policy side of this. The, the first one is, is car sharing classified as, or looked at more as transit, um, as an alternative, as, as, a, as a transportation alternative? And I, I asked that question in the sense of, if you're trying to, to figure out the fact of the tra transit network, or you're trying to figure out mode share, is it just a lot of times it doesn't you don't really just aggregate between these different types of new services so does it lump into just transit if you're going to do a survey you probably just uh, categorize on, on the regular driving but i think i feel it's a new mode uh over i mean over the last 10 years it's picked up really as a new mode uh when my friend asked me how are you going to get there i say sit car and they know it's driving but it's not my car it's just like an hourly rental um, but yeah, there's definitely an interaction there with transit. Um, and the last sentence of that, of that Cartigo video, the promotional video was, Cartigo is my individual public transportation. So it's, it's public transportation in that you're sharing those costs, but it's on your own schedule. You, uh, you use it as if it was. And then on that cost issue, because yeah. I'm thinking about it, in DC they have that the capital bike share. I know that's right, <clears> spreading, <throat> bike share is spreading, and for a lot of those, it's the city or the region uh, enters into a contract with a private entity to manage it. And it's uh, wondering if it, are there any experiences with Car to Go in which it's the city or the county entering into an agreement with Car to Go, like paying them to put those resources out there? I don't think I've seen that yet, but. Um but yeah, definitely for bike sharing, it is like that the, the city um, will search for a contractor. But I think most of the city's car to go operates and operates in, they have approached the cities. They say, we have this field of cars, we want to provide this service to, to your citizens. And uh, some some councils take more time, Some it's, most of them have approved uh, to, to put the cars in, in, in their cities. Um, I mean, I think it's beneficial to the cities, but I don't know the cities are willing to pay for it. Do you know, um, so this, uh, this alternative mode of transportation become a, a competition to the transit agencies. And now, you know, in the last 20 years, I like, guess, transit agencies have uh, become the traditional competition of the car, telecommuting. You see, in many urban areas, telecommuting has increased higher than, than tra transit share. So this is another competition. Do you know how, or have you heard how transit agencies receive car to go? Do they oppose? Do they support? Well, the, the truth is that a, a car to go has gone into a lot of cities where transit agencies are not big. So, um, Austin, for example, Columbus, Ohio, they just went in. Uh, so, I still haven't seen that that clash between transit agencies and car to go. But in my opinion, car to go is not detrimental. To transit, I think it, it actually helps the case for transit if it allows people to to sell their cars, take transit to and from work, then have this as an option for their occasional trips. Because sometimes that's, I mean, if you have a car, you're you're thinking about selling it or, or keeping it or whatnot. You really you need to figure out your commute first. Because your commute is really what you spend most of the time traveling. So if transit is there, you can take transit. Then car sharing becomes a becomes viable in that region. So. I, I mean, I haven't seen a clash. I certainly don't expect to because because of these things I mentioned of, of how car sharing and transit work together. Frederick? Well, I tried to just uh, a remark to go uh, along this, uh, this topic and uh, bringing a European perspective on it, uh, which is uh, in the city of Paris having this auto lift, where yeah. it is in Paris having the public transit is massively, is massively used with the metro and a lot of the different uh, things. And I, I really think in this case, yes, this is really complementary. In fact, for, for me, this, the, the, the users of this system will be rather users of public transit in it. Uh, in it uh, and it will be a complementary uh, thing where they, when they need to typically to, uh, to go to some shopping and bring uh, luggage or whatever, they will use in this case these systems. This will allow them not to, to be the owner of, of the car. So I, I really think that that's uh, beneficial. Uh, Rather than uh, competition. Uh, any more questions? We're brushing up against time, but anybody has a question? 
street. Do you know what is the probability that a person will not find a car available? Right, so when I looked at Aston, um, I found it to be about 55% on a daily basis. Uh, I recently took a trip up to Portland, and it was much, much lower <laughs> than that. I went to go out on Friday night, no cars. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it, it was tough. Um, they give you they give you this 15 minute window where you can, I mean, you see the car available on your cell phone or your computer, you can reserve it. It buys you 15 minutes to get to that car. So it's not like you're running, sprinting for it before somebody grabs it. So uh, that is a nice thing that they, that they add to their system. Um, yeah, definitely, as you saw, as you saw in the animations, it, it varies, uh, varies throughout the day. So, uh, and yeah, throughout the region, too. You, you saw they, they were punching up in downtown. Downtown, you probably have a better, better chance of finding one midday. But if you're in the middle of the night, you're probably not gonna find anything downtown. So, yeah, yeah it's been hit or miss, really. They need more cars. Final questions? Right? Thank you, it's been a great audience.